Mr. McNeil is present with his counsel. The state's attorneys are here, but not Mr. Perkins. We're okay to go forward without Mr. Perkins. Thank you. Counsel, is Dr. Perper's uh, written report a part of the record? I think it was a, it is. an exhibit uh, to one of the memoranda. I can't remember. Yes, I, I attached it as an exhibit. Sir. Okay, I'll give this one back to you then. Dr. Perper, if you would retake the witness stand. Any housekeeping matters before we start? Um, there, there is one, Your Honor, that, uh, that Mr. Grunander and I were just discussing, and I don't know whether we'll, we'll get to them today or not, um, but there is a possibility of, of getting to the... Okay. And, and we had um, submitted in our 404B um, uh, some parts of the statements that... Uh, uh, we think should should be excluded uh, from the inmates pursuant to 404B, and we'd like to, to be able to address that before they, they take the stand. How long will that take? We, we, Your Honor, Judge, we haven't, uh, this is the first time we spoke just five minutes ago during the break about the issue. Um, we might want to have a little bit just to kind of contemplate his objection to our response. Um, we planned to possibly put an inmate or two on the stand today, although I don't think we're probably going to get there. I wonder if we even reserved a little bit of time this afternoon to address the issue, and I don't know. Okay. I, I would prefer to just get them on the stand and deal with it as the evidence comes in, but uh, if there's... I, I don't want to have the jury waiting while we do work, and so... Uh, our, our, my thoughts were at the end of the day, perhaps we could address it if, if that's the appropriate time. Let's see where we get to. Thank you. Please be seated. Back on the record in the matter of State of Utah versus McNeil. Mr. McNeil is present with his counsel. The state's attorneys are present. The jury is seated. Dr. Perper is on the stand. You may cross. Dr. Perper, uh, just initially as a housekeeping matter, Your Honor, if I may approach and show what's been marked as Exhibit 8 Go ahead. Do you recognize that as a copy of, uh, of 
the toxicology report, or not toxicology report, of the lab report that you've been discussing from the American Fork Hospital on April 11, 2007? Yes. And it also has a comparison to uh, labs that were taken March 29th and reported on March 30, 2007? Correct. Okay. Now, we'd move that uh, Defense Exhibit AA be received. No objection. No. AA is received. Thank you. And Dr. Perper, uh, uh, you were hired, as I understood your testimony, um, by the Utah County Attorney's Office in October or November of, of 2011, is that right? Yes. And uh, when, um, when you were hired, uh, you were asked um, uh, specifically uh, in, in their retention request uh, to evaluate the accuracy of the above determinations, the medical examiner's determinations, the Utah State Medical Examiner's determinations, uh, continue quote, and to analyze this rather complex and intricate set of circumstantial and medical findings in order to determine whether there is sufficient evidence with a reason reasonable degree of medical cert or certainty for establishing the actual cause and manner of death of Mrs. McNeil. Yes, good. Okay. And uh, prior to being hired, uh, by the Utah County Attorney's Office, uh, you had appeared um, as a guest expert uh, on the Nancy Grace Show, correct? Yes, correct. And that was on December 7th of 2010? Yes, correct. And, and at that time, when you appeared as an expert, um, uh, she, she was doing a report about the McNeil case, right? I think at that time there was very initial report, and I think I mentioned at yeah, that time so that there were elements which were missing. Yes. Right, yeah, and, and so, so you didn't have the full case file to review at that time, right? Absolutely not. And so you, you had some, some information that had been released to the media, right, to consider? Yes, when, when I appeared on the show, and usually the, what happened, they had asking questions, you know. And yeah, and, and I'm just asking, asking what you had. And so at that time, you didn't have the case file, you just had information that had, that had been released to the no, media, right? No, Okay. And uh, based upon uh, the, the little bit of information that you had, uh, you made a conclusion to Nancy Grace that uh, you believe that the Utah State Medical Examiner was wrong and that Michelle McNeil drowned, correct? Um, can, do you have it so I can see in what I do, way, yeah. what, what I said yeah. exactly? I think you start on about the 14th page in. Sure. He started with a transcript, I think, of his, of his uh, report to the 911 operator. Yeah, and if you would just, just look for, and, and for then, the, Dr. Perper, if, if you would just please look for the information to answer my question rather than just talking. Well, you asked me to answer what I told Nancy Grace. My question what was, I, what was what Dr. I Perper, told? my question was, you told Nancy Grace that that you believe the Utah State Medical Examiner was wrong and that you believe that Michelle's cause of death was drowning, right? Do you not recall the, that, that show? I don't, I don't see where I'm my, what is my uh, field. Do you have a page number? I'm sorry. Yeah, it's the 14th page. It, it, it has to say, obviously, Dr. Perper. It does, yeah. And I fail to see this here. Can you Maybe point it out to me, please? I, I don't see it. I'm really glad you had it to show me. Hopefully, I got 
actually a complete copy. Of now I'll get you another one, and I apologize. It's okay. I apologize. I think I only handed you the first part that didn't have okay. you in it. I, I don't see here, and I can read it to you, the entire thing, what I specifically criticize any doctor or Dr. McNeil in particular. I don't see no, his name not mentioned. Ask, asking you about criticizing um, Dr. McNeil. I'm just saying that you, you drew the conclusion on Nancy Grace that, that you believe that Michelle drowned, correct? Yes, I said that. Yes, right. I, I said and that based on the init, I said that based on the initial information, right. it appears that he's drowned. I also okay. mentioned that we I don't just, have the entire I'll ask you information question. available. Doctor Perper, please don't don't just go on. Answer my question, and and then we'll we'll this will go much quicker. Well, I try to answer your question in entirely. I'm sorry that I didn't do that. Okay, so just, just to be clear, in December 7, 2010. Uh, based upon the information that you had, you, f you formed the opinion that Michelle McNeil drowned, correct? Yes. This is an apparent information based on very limited information. I understand. And, and as, as you were having this conversation um, with, with Nancy Grace, there was discussion about uh, CPR and how that uh, uh, could be uh, some evidence of drowning, correct? Yes. And Nancy Grace says, the fact, doctor, that all of this water, Dr. Perper, was expelled when the EMTs got there tells me that he did not perform CPR on her, even a novice that performs CPR on a drowning victim. And you said, exactly. And she goes on, water pours out of your nose and mouth. It just pours out when you start pumping. And you answered, absolutely. Yes, sir. Right? Okay. Are you aware in this case that... Um, that when Michelle was uh, pulled out of the bathtub, uh, that uh, CPR was then uh, performed with uh, Christy Daniels initially doing chest compressions? Let me say, by Dr. McNeil? Uh, Dr. McNeil doing uh, breasts and Christy Daniels doing chest compressions? My, yes, my information. I'm just asking if you're aware of that. I am aware of that. Okay, and, and you're aware that no water was reported pouring out of her mouth or nose at that time, right? That's, that's correct. And you're aware that after Christy Daniels uh, uh, had done some compressions for a period of time, then she was replaced by her husband, Doug Daniels, who continued to do compressions? I understand that after she was taken out of the water and there was hey. resuscitated. So, Please Perper. let me finish, because otherwise you hey, don't hey. know what's my answer. Dr. Perper, yes no. let me just intervene here. On cross-examination, most questions posed to you will call for a yes or no answer. Okay. If, no. There's, a, if there's a concern or you feel like you have something to explain, Mr. Grunander will have an opportunity to... Okay. examine you further and I'm sure he'll take careful notes. Go ahead. So you understand that after Christy Daniels um, performed compressions for a time, she was replaced by her husband Doug Daniels who performed compressions? Yes. And then after Doug Daniels performed compressions for, for one or two minutes, what seemed like an eternity, that uh, the police officers got there and then they took over performing uh, compressions in the bathroom? Yes. And that at that time um, uh, Josh Motzinger was doing compressions, and Officer Ormond was um, uh, doing the uh, Ambu bag uh, in the in the bathroom. Yes. And at that time, there was no water um, pouring out of her mouth or nose. I don't recall you, but I think that the water was after she was taken in the other room. 
And so then after they did um, CPR for, for a minute or two, which seemed like a long time to them, uh, she was then taken to the, to the bedroom, correct? Yes. And then they switched, and uh, Officer Ormond uh, began doing compressions, and Officer Motzinger then began doing the AMBU bag. Yes. And after a period of time, as the, the paramedics began setting up, uh, then uh, there was this expulsion of water. Yes. So there was uh, quite a period of time uh, that passed during CPR before water was actually uh, expelled. It was some period of the time, yes. So it's, it's not like was, uh, it was represented on Nancy Grace that you agreed with that, that if somebody's drowned, then, then water would immediately begin uh, coming out the mouth or nose, correct? What I said on Nancy Grace is based on the information I had at this time. Oh, yeah, if, 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 there is, if there is compression of, of the chest, which is significant and appropriate uh, compression of the chest, there's going to be expulsion of the water, as it was in this case. At the time when I, when I answered, I did not know whether the, the, there was an initial uh, resuscitation attempt, whether this resuscitation attempt was effective, and therefore my question is based on a theory that proper and immediate resuscitation was performed. Okay. And, and so then uh, uh, it was you know, roughly uh, 10, 11 months later that, that you were retained by the Utah County Attorney's Office, right? Correct. And, uh, and how much are you being paid for your testimony? Uh, so far, I think I was, I don't remember the exact amount, but it was, I think it is between $10,000 and $14,000, some, somewhere along this kind of... Uh, Okay, and, and you'll be compensated more for your testimony here in court today? Not yet. Not yet, okay. And uh, after you were retained, then you were given lots more information to review, correct? Correct. And, uh, and you, you've received additional information even as recently as, as this past summer, correct? Correct. And uh, in the course of um, uh, Reviewing the information, uh, you also received the toxicology report uh, that the medical examiners uh, completed, not, not the lab test that, that's, ex that's exhibit up there. I'm yes. The toxicology that has the, the oxycodone and, and such on it. Right? Correct. And, uh, and at the preliminary hearing, uh, you indicated that, um, that on the initial autopsy, those drugs were found correctly as being in therapeutic dose. Correct? Yes. And he said, and in my opinion, though the drugs might have contributed to the death in some way, to the drowning, they were not the cause of death. That's correct. Uh, that's your opinion, right? That's my opinion today, too. Okay. <coughs> and you also indicated uh, in, at the preliminary hearing that you believe the medical examiner uh, who did the autopsy missed a number of findings, uh, which were obvious in the autopsy, right? That's correct and uh, which uh, included the fact that an individual, that the individual, Michelle, uh, did not have evidence of foreign body reaction in the lungs as it was made. That's correct. And so you believe that the autopsy did have evidence of, of foreign body reaction in the lungs that wasn't noted by the medical examiner? No, I think that you misunderstood me. Oh, okay. I, said, I said in my report, I said that there was no, she, in, in, in her report, Dr. Freake mentioned, I think, the presence of granuloma. And I said that there was no granuloma, there was some scarring in the lungs. Okay. And, and later on, in the photographs which I took, I documented that scarring. Okay. And, uh, and you testified today about um, your belief that there was inhalation of a lot of water into the lungs, right? I, I believe that there was water in the lung because there was additional, because for a number of things. Number one, as I mentioned in my initial report, and also during my uh, preliminary testimony, the lungs were wearing more than the usual weight. Mm -hmm. And I said at that time, it's because due of the congestion. And therefore, and then at that time I was asked, I, I believe by you, whether the lungs were well aerated. And I, in my opinion, I said that the increased weight of the lung 
indicated it was not well aerated. Uh, actually, I, at the preliminary hearing, uh, you indicated that congestion in the lung uh, is people dying for any reason. It's a very common finding. Yes. That's, that's what you said, yes, right? That's correct. And, and so at the preliminary hearing, you said that, that the congestion in the lung wasn't a significant factor uh, alone in relation to making a diagnosis of drowning, correct? It was not alone a significant factor. That's correct. Uh, you went on to say that pulmonary edema is fairly common in, in many causes of death. That's right? correct. And, and so at the preliminary hearing, uh, you said that what tips the scale for you uh, is the presence of large amounts of fluid in the stomach uh, and in the airway, which cannot then be explained, right? I, I think that during my, my uh, preliminary hearing, I made a number of statements. Number one, that they could not Dr. have... Dr. could you just turn to page 1451 in the preliminary hearing? I put it up there for you. I'm sorry, which word is this it? Yes, it's right there. Right, uh, right there in the bound volume. Page 51 of this 1451. Up, no, of the... This one right Dr. Here. Perper, it's... Dr. Perper. Dr. Perper, it's right here. This bound volume. I'm sorry. It's all right. What page? 1451. 1551? 1451. 1451. Yes, I'm at one four five. Okay, so, so right in the middle of the page, line 12, I asked you the question. So really, uh, it's the stomach that, that tips the scale for you. And you answered, the, and the airway, and the amount of, in other words, presence of large amounts of fluid in the stomach and in the airway, which cannot then be explained. That, that, that was your yes, testimony at the preliminary hearing, that's right? That's what I said. And, and in order to um, uh, make the assertion of how much water uh, was uh, found in, in Michelle's stomach, you had to rely on the testimony of the, of, of the officers that reported Michelle throwing up, correct? This was my determination at that time, right. Right. And, well, even now, that, that's, that's the only evidence uh, that, that you have in relation to the amount of water that was thrown up, correct? No, because as I mentioned in the, my previous testimony, there is evidence of dilution which I didn't discuss at the time when I offer my report, but I mentioned it I during... I understand. That wasn't my question, though. I'm talking about the evidence about water being thrown up. The, the evidence of water being thrown out is, is exclusively from the, from the evidence officers. which was supplied by the people who provided the resuscitation. That's and, correct. And during the trial, we've heard testimony from Officer Motzinger that, that it was um, uh, a lot of mat water. He doesn't know how much, but it was enough that, uh, that it was able to, to go into his glove and, and uh, down his leg and into his boot. Yes, and there was the, also ex a, a tube, uh, in other words, from the airway, was drainage of the water. Yes. yes. And then Officer Ormond testified that there was a, a second incident uh, where not as much as the first time um, came out, but he still thought that it was, was a lot. And he thought that, that the Officer Ormond said that, that the first time he thought was three or four cups and the second time was something less than that. Yes, this is from the, the this witness. Is from the trial. Session. Correct. Okay. And, and so this water bottle, uh, th this is 16.9 fluid ounces. Mm -hmm. I don't know what it is. I'll have to look at the different bottles. This is 500 milliliter. Yes. Yes. A cup of water is usually about 250 milliliter. Mm -hmm. Therefore, as in I made in my previous calculation, Two cups of water of 250 milliliter would be one liter of water. If there were additional three cups, would be additional three quarters of a liter. And then I said one... Mr. Perper, I'll ask you another question and then, then I'll ask you to answer. Okay, can I have the water back, please? Can I have the water, please? Thank you. So, Dr. Perper, if somebody is just watching vomit has come out and, and, and it's coming out like this. Fair to say that, that it's pretty hard to, to estimate exactly how much water is, is coming out. Objection. Speculation. Yeah, he may answer. Overruled.
Isn't that a fair, I, fair statement? Well, can, you, can you repeat your question? Yeah, so I can if, if somebody's just watching water come out, whether it's being poured or, or, or thrown up, isn't it fair to say that it's hard to, to just eyeball estimate how much well, water? Well, I, I, I would think that, that somebody who is pouring water and they are approximately half a gallon of water, a person would say that's a significant amount of water pulling out of the particular container. Whether it would be exactly three-quarter of, a, of a, uh, one and three-quarter of a liter, or would be one liter and one quarter, or be three-quarter, I, I, I would agree with you he could not precisely make the assessment without measuring. But that's an estimate of his. If his estimate, if his estimate is lower than that, then it's lower than that. If his estimate is higher than that, it's higher than that. If it's appropriate, it's appropriate. I have, I have to rely my determination on what he said. He didn't say it was half a cup of water. Dr. He Dr. said it was a significant amount which he estimated. That's right. My, my question was simply, it's really hard to estimate how much water uh, is being thrown up. Isn't that a fair statement? It's in general, but it depends on the person who is doing the estimate. Some people are more accurate, others are less. Absolutely. Fair statement. And, and even the amount that I poured out of, of, of this bottle was more than enough to, to constitute enough water to go into a glove, down a leg, into a boot, right? I, as I told you, I'm not a specialist in this kind of estimates, and I don't know how good that would be. In addition, um, well, let's see, before we move on, you know, if I may approach, you may. Dr. Parker, I'm showing you what's been marked as a defendant's exhibit DB. Do you recommend that? Yes, this is a, a chest frontal view, which is from American Fork Hospital. And um, is dated 4-11-2007 at 12:40, which and a, then it's a, you want me to read what it is? Uh, yeah, in just a second. That's a chest X-ray uh, of Michelle McNeil, correct? This is a chest X-ray, which which I can read whatever is the comment. What do you want me to do with this one? Wait for my question and answer my question. That's all I want you to do. Okay. And so in that chest x-ray, uh, it's reported as a normal chest x-ray, correct? Yes. It reports no infiltrates in the chest, right? Yes. Uh, no, uh, uh, doesn't report um, any abnormalities with the lungs, correct? In, in this particular case, what it says in his diagnostic impression, mm -hmm. it says a satisfactory endotracheal tube position. No evidence of acute disease, which means that an endotracheal tube, a tube was placed in the trachea, which is the wine pipe, and that's all that it says. We'll, we'll look up no the evidence of acute disease. Yeah, it, it also says that, that there's um, no pneumothorax. Um, no it says no acute infiltrates. And no, acute and no pneumothorax or no pleural effusion. Acute infiltrates usually refers to infiltrates which are usually of an infla inflammatory nature, like somebody has pneumonia or somebody has cancer, and they would see something which is whitish. That's the way they it's appear for the on the chest ray. Uh, this, if there is significant, if there is significant edema, they may diagnose edema. If they, they may not diagnose edema. They didn't diagnose edema. Did the pneumothorax means that there is no air inside the chest wall which compresses the lung. Which, so that, and, just, 
a pneumothorax would be just outside of the lung where a pocket of air would, would be compressing the lung, correct? Correct. And, and so it doesn't diagnose a pneumothorax. It doesn't diagnose pulmonary edema, correct? No, no it says and it doesn't diagnose pulmonary edema. It doesn't negate pulmonary edema. It says there are no acute infiltrate. Acute infiltrates are focal concentration of acute inflammatory cells or cells of cancer. Mayor, you know, I, I moved on for any objection? DD is received. May I approach? You may. It says no evidence of acute disease, too, right? That's correct. It also comments on the, the cardiomediastinal silhouette, too, correct? May I see, please? and indicates that, uh, that that appears normal. A, a cardiomediastinal silhouette means that the shape of the heart and the shape of the middle area of the chest are normal. In this particular case, obviously, this chest ray, like many times, did not diagnose that there was some enlargement of the heart. Not very severe, but the heart weighed about, I believe, um, it was Mayor about 400 grams. So, so it, this is hypertrophy of the heart, is enlargement of the heart. This is not detected on the chest X-ray because chest X-ray many times are not able to diagnose more subtle pathological findings. Chest X-rays, however, are able to pick up um, uh, edema in the lungs. Sometimes yes, and sometimes no. That's the true answer. You also found um, in, in your examination and review of the autopsy uh, that, uh, that there, were, there was clinical evidence of hypertension that the Utah State Medical Examiner, Dr. Fricke, uh, didn't identify. Isn't that correct? I think she did not identify evidence of hypertension, which I identify in the kidney. In other words, she knew that the person has hypertension, and this this hypertension, high blood Dr. pressure. Dr. Perber, could I ask you another question and just ask you to, to answer them one at a time? Please. Okay. So uh, in, in your review of the autopsy, uh, you found evidence of, of clinical hypertension in Michelle McNeil's kidney uh, that, that Dr. Fricke did not elaborate on. Correct. correct? Dr. Fricke did elaborate to some degree uh, about uh, hypertensive changes in the kidney, but you you elaborated even further. I do not, can you, if you would show me in her report that she identified some hypertensive pathology in the kidney, because I don't remember that at all. Thank you. Yes, she, I, she said, the answer is yes, she said that the kidney is granular, but granular without any other explanation microscopically of the granularity, which on microscopic examination. Dr. Prober, yeah, she, she identified, yes, yes. She, ident she identified the, 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 uh, the, uh, changes in the arteries, but she did not diagnose it in her diagnosis. Right. And so she, as I read the report, and, and she, I, I, or she identified arterial sclerosis in the kidney. She correct? identified the changes, but she did not make a diagnosis of arterial okay. sclerosis. And, and you diagnosed arteriolosclerosis. That's, the kidney, that's right. And the answer is that those are small arteries. That's why the arteriole. Right. So it's uh, not arteriosclerosis, it's arteriolo, which means small artery, muscular artery. So 
in short, you diagnosed more hypertensive changes in the kidney than Dr. Fricky did, correct? No, I, I think that what, what, what she did, she basically diagnosed similar things to each, what I diagnosed, only she did, did not made the specific diagnosis of arteriolar sclerosis. But her description mentioned that there was thickening and sclerosis of the small arteries. At the preliminary hearing, you said, so again, the autopsy report missed what we call the arteriolosclerosis of the kidney. That's what right. you said at the That's preliminary hearing. Right. Okay. And then, then again, uh, you commented on the, the drugs at the preliminary hearing on page 1400 and said that, that in your opinion, within a reasonable degree of medical certainty, uh, there's not sufficient certainty to consider them as a significant cause of death. Exactly. Right. Uh, at the preliminary hearing, you also um, uh, commented about your findings in relation to the liver, correct? Correct. And, and also commented that you felt that uh, Dr. Fricke didn't identify the full extent of damage to the liver. Correct. And Dr. Fricke identified fatty liver disease, right? Correct. And, and you went on to find moderate to, to marked vacuolization. Did no. I say that right? No. No? Okay. What, Would you, what I defined, I said that there was moderate to marked fatty change of the liver. There's the same fatty change of the liver which Dr. Fricke also identified. What Dr. Fricke did not identify was that some of the liver cells, their nuclei were vacuolated, which means that there was a kind of sugar, which we call it glycogen, which was inside the nucleus of the cells. And then it expands the substance of the nucleus to the periphery. So instead of having a blob of nucleus in the center, you have a ring of chromatin of nuclear substance. And that's called vacuolization of the hepatox, hepatic cell. It's a vacuolization of the nuclei, which sometimes is seen in diabetes, but it's not diagnostic for diabetes. At any rate, wherever it came from, you observed it in the liver, right? I'm sorry? Where, whatever the cause, you found it pursuant to your microscopic examination of the liver slide. That's correct. The, uh, the liver, like the heart, has some variability in relation to, to findings uh, that may appear on various slides. Isn't that a fair I'm statement? I'm not sure that I understand your okay. question. Okay. So as, as I understood your direct testimony, you explained that uh, when a medical examiner preserves tissue from, from the heart or the liver, uh, it is uh, preserved in wax. Is that, that correct? Preserved informally. And, um, well, isn't that it then put into paraffin wax, and so then slices are it's, taken? Well, what it's after it's, after it's put in formalin, mm -hmm. it's taken out of the formalin, and it's, it's passed through different alcoholic solution, which takes the water out, dehydrated. And after it's dehydrated, it's basically placed in a paraffin, which then solidifies and they have a, a paraffin block. And this paraffin block is then cut with a special kind of knife, which is called a microtome, in very, very thin section. Those sections then are, are placed on water, on warm water, and then they are placed on the slide, stained, and then covered with a cover slip, and then examined under the microscope. And so each time slides are, are created, there is that thin slice taken off of that sample that's preserved in the paraffin. Correct? That's correct. And so uh, there, there is some variability uh, in what is seen on, on those slides as, as different slices are, are taken and, and then examined by different medical examiners, correct? Variability means difference between either two location or it's in the same site. I'm not sure to which one you refer. Okay. 
uh, let's use what's been talked about al already. Um, with the heart, uh, myocarditis can be seen in some portions of the heart and not seen in other portions of the heart. That's correct. And, and so Dr. Gray testified yesterday, I think you heard, that uh, there's some variability uh, in between slides and, and the number of blue dots that, that you may see on, on the slides. There is very, right? okay. Is, isn't if, that correct? If, if a person cuts a number of slides, like in this case, they will cut four sections of the slides from the heart, mm -hmm. okay? If somebody examines those kind of slides and it's myocarditis in one of them, then you can make a diagnosis of focal myocarditis in one section. But if there is no myocarditis in any one of those slides, then period, there is no myocarditis. In the four slides... Dr. Perper, appreciate your explanation. The only point I'm trying to make is that, uh, as Dr. Gray test, do you disagree with Dr. Gray's testimony that, that there can be differences uh, in in what is observed on different cuts? There can be differences if there is differences. But right. they, if so, there's no differences, okay. there's no differences. Right. So you did not review the same slides that Dr. Fricke reviewed, correct? My understanding is that I reviewed the same slides. Well, you reviewed slides that were cut and sent to you, right? If, okay, I understand what you're saying. If you are saying that the slide, that I did not receive slides which were cut and show myocarditis, and I receive another set of slides which, which did not show myocarditis. No, that's not what I'm asking. All I'm asking is that you were given your own set of slides, correct? Those, no, those are not my sets of slides. They are original slides of the autopsy. Okay. My understanding is that I received the original slides of the autopsy. You There's another possibility that I receive copies of the slides. What it means that the same block of paraffin from which the first very thin section was cut, an additional section is cut which is also extremely thin and basically it's similar, almost identical, virtually identical. Whether there was here cut a set of microscopic slides which I didn't see and have myocarditis and the block was cut much deeper so it doesn't correspond to the slide which I see, then I, I can say, show me the other slides and I'll examine them. That's, that's, that's my only point, is that you don't know that you received the same slide that Dr. Fricke reviewed, correct? My assumption is, my understanding is, my understanding is that I received the same slides or a cut which basically is identical in morphology to the one which he didn't cut. If this assumption is not true, then my conclusion is not true. Okay. And you don't know whether your assumption is true or not? I don't have any reason to assume differently because I was not inform informed that differently. But okay. I cannot exclude that this is a possibility. Okay. And we got into that conversation because I was going to say the same thing is true of the liver as well, that there may be differences from slide to slide as well, the block it, of paraffin wax is cut. Isn't that a fair statement? The, the answer is that theoretically, yes, practically, no. Okay. At the preliminary hearing, uh, you testified that uh, the Utah medical examiner's opinion that Michelle McNeil possibly died of a fatal arrhythmia due to hypertension can be reasonably accepted, correct? As I said before in my, in my direct, because of the focal scarring of the heart and because of the evidence of hypertension, I cannot either exclude, there is a possibility which I cannot either exclude or confirm. Preliminary hearing, you just said yes to, to that well, question. Well, it's the same thing. That's a possibility. I am just explaining that's, that's what the possibility is. It may happen or it may not happen. And uh,
uh, at the preliminary hearing, you also said if she would have had no fluids in the airway and no fluids in the stomach upon uh, resuscitation vomiting and just edema, you would not have made the determination of drowning. Correct. If, she would, if, if there would be no evidence of, of, of fluid such as you note, and you know it would not be dilution of the blood, as I mentioned, then definitely I could make a diagnosis of drowning. Dr. Perper, do you recall from the autopsy, uh, Dr. Fricke finding that Michelle McNeil had a large amount of very firm stool in her colon? I don't recall that, but assuming that's true, what, what would be the answer to the question? And, and so uh, that would mean that, that we, what we would call constipation, correct? Well, it depends how hard is the stool, you know, I mean, it's, it, it, normally, in a normal process, in a normal individual, in the colon, the stool is solid because all the water is absorbed. Now, if, if in this particular case, the stool was stone hard, and, and, and this, I didn't such description, then it's consistent with constipation. But finding feces, which is not the nicest thing in the world to find, yeah. but they are there in the colon, that's seen in virtually in every autopsy which the person didn't have diarrhea. Isn't it fair to say that uh, a notation in an autopsy of a large amount of firm stool would be a, a typical way for a medical examiner to identify constipation? No. No, it's okay. not. Oh, fair to say that uh, if someone is constipated, uh, that uh, drinking water is, is one uh, thing that is appropriate to do to try and enhance your ability to have a bowel movement? If somebody is constipated, it depends on the degrees of constipation. Okay. There are constipation which are fairly physiologic. Most every person at one time in his life may be constipated. A constipation which are pathologically. The treatment of constipation is different. People who are physiologically constipated, and there was no evidence in Michelle that she had any pathology to account for constipation. There are all kinds of pills which soften the, 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 the stools or, or enhance the motility of the intestine, so the constipation is cured or addressed. Michelle had been taking uh, oxycodone uh, since the day of her surgery. Oxycodone has a side effect of constipation, doesn't yes, it? Yes, opiates usually tend to, co to cause constipation. That's correct. At the preliminary hearing on page 1491, if you want to review it. Uh, you 1491? 1491, yeah. You indicated that the, uh, the levels of medication in the toxicology report were small. 1491. Uh, which line do you refer to? So line four, I asked you the question, and in your review of the toxicology report done by Dr. Fricke, you found that the levels that were, we were talking about the toxicology, were small within yes. a therapeutic range. Right? Yes, so, yeah. I said that. And that's consistent with what you put in the report, too. Yes, correct. Right? Uh, the, And then uh, we, we did talk uh, to some degree at the preliminary hearing about um, uh, this, this dilution uh, discussion that we've had today as well, correct? Yes. And if you turn to page uh, 1476. 76. 1476. Okay. 
So starting on line three, I asked you the question, okay, and all I'm asking you to do right now is point out any values that you believe are consistent with dilution. And we were yes. referring to the same exhibit, which was the, the lab report, right? Yes. And your answer was, there are no value except for the value of which I discussed of sodium. Yes. However, as I said before, this is not the initial screen. This is the screen after treatment. Yes. Right? That's I, what you said? Yes. And then I asked you, so did I understand your testimony right, that only sodium on defendant's exhibit number one is consistent with, and you said right, and I finished up with dilution? Yes. And then you said right. Because the calcium is elevated at 12.3, it's high when initially it was 2.4. Right. Okay. That, that's what you said at the preliminary hearing, right? Yes. Dr. Perper, isn't it uh, accurate to say that uh, when somebody dies, there are fairly rapid changes to their blood? Mm, well, it depends. When, when somebody dies, there are changes in the blood, and their kinetics, their rapidity, depends on a variety of factors, okay? For example, hey. uh, Thank you sorry. You may. Is that right if I set up the Yeah, Inside the artery, in a person who's alive, there are lots of cells, correct? Yes, there are a lot of cells. There are also all kinds of substances, chemical in dilution. Right. And so, uh, inside cells, <laughs> potassium levels are high and sodium levels are low, correct? Correct. So K stands for potassium, Na for sodium, right? I'm sorry. It's, a, it's okay. I can see it from here. Can you see? Okay. okay. I don't mean to make this hard. Yes. It's not a good thing to do it. So K is the typical symbol for potassium, right? Yes, correct. And Na is a typical symbol for sodium. Yes, the function of it. And outside of the cell, um, in the other plasma or whatever you yes. refer to the fluid, then the sodium level is very high and potassium is low. Well, the, 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 the cell high as compared to the sodium, the potassium is lower in the outside, in the plasma, in the liquid, in the liquid component of the blood that it's in the red blood cell. That's correct. And in order to keep the potassium and, and other contents inside the cell, the body needs to, to have energy, right, or, or be alive. Uh, what happened is, yes, there is, right? there, is, there, is a, there is a cell, there is a membrane which covers this right. thing. This membrane is a semi-permeable semi membrane, which there is a mechanism by which the cell, the living cell, is doing that. The, the red blood cells are very particular because they don't have a nucleus. Mm -hmm. their, their function is not like the function of any other cell in the body. Every other cell in the body has a nucleus. Red blood cells don't have a nucleus. They are little sacs which contain sodium, and potassium, and indeed in this little cell there is more sodium 
than potassium. Now, what happened in okay. the drowning? Okay, I think you've answered my question, and so now let me ask another one. And so, when a person dies, the the energy necessary to to keep the contents inside the cell goes away. Right. Right. Correct. And so then, the high amount of potassium, which is inside the cell, enters the plasma part of the blood, correct? Yes, potassium that, leaks out of the red blood cells into the blood, yes. Which then causes the potassium to rise. Increase, but that's a, that, right, but this, this is an element which is time dependent because when this happens, also the red blood cell disintegrate. That's right. what we call hemolysis. hemolysis. It breaks up. And hemolysis happens quite quickly, correct? Hemolysis can happen fairly quickly at a variable. The, 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 uh, we take many times blood from people who are, which are dead for one day yeah. or two days. But in people which we found out from one day, as a matter of fact, we don't see hemolysis. But okay. in some people we do. But usually, the earlier the time interval, the less the likelihood of hemolysis, unless water, water enters in the system and then red blood cells break up. Dr. Popper, even without water entering the system, there's lots of literature out there to indicate that even within 15 minutes of death, hmm? hemolysis... No, starts. no, there's no significant hemolysis usually within 15 minutes of death because there's many cases in which I took blood from the heart or blood peripherally, the, the blood was not hemolytic. In other words, there was the, uh, uh, um, component of the blood when you spin it, which was free. Dr. Of, Proper, you even said in your report that, that you can't make conclusions in relation to potassium in the blood because hemolysis occurs very quickly. Isn't that correct? Yeah, correct? in this particular case, in particular, is drowning. It's water entering here, and therefore the this. That's not what you said in your report, though. Yeah, it, the same thing. It, it's drowning. In drowning, there's additional fast hemolysis. And, and I'm going to ask you about drowning. But in your report, you didn't say that because of hemolysis due to drowning uh, that, that you can't make conclusions about potassium. You said you can't make conclusions about potassium because it's unreliable due to hemolysis, period. Yes. That's but, what you said but, in your report. Okay, now let's talk about drowning. And so when, when you somebody drowns and there's some amount of, of um, water that may enter the bloodstream, that further accelerates the breakdown of the membrane around the cells, mm -hmm. causing potassium to leak out into the, to the plasma, correct? The red blood cell remain intact in the blood because it's what's called an, an osmotic balance in which the blood is salty and therefore keeps those cells intact. If you add water, if there is hemodilution, mm -hmm. then those cells can break apart, and therefore the potassium is released. Right. On this uh, lab report, which is exhibit AA, the sample that was tested clearly shows uh, that it was a hemolyzed sample, correct? Yes. In fact, it says that it was 4 plus right. hemolyzed, which is right. the maximum on, on their scale. Yes. Right? And so the lab values that, that are reflected there are taken from blood, which, is, which has already been hemolyzed to at least the highest degree that, yeah. that uh, they measure on that scale. I right? believe blood was taken on two occasions. I don't know if on both occasions it was hemolyzed, but it Four plus, yes, it would be hemolyzed. And on the, on the lab results, we don't know when that sample was taken, whether it was soon after she arrived at the ER or whether it was after she was pronounced dead, do we? I think that there's a time, there's a time when the blood was taken, like 1248, and then it's another one, about 130, so there are times. Yeah, and, and Dr. Van Wagener has testified in this case. He, do, he doesn't know when the sample was taken. Well, if the time don't, with the, on the time of the test don't reflect the time when, when actually the blood was given, then you can make a determination. That's correct. And, and the timing of the drawing of the blood 
makes a big difference in relation to evaluating the significance of, of the numbers, correct? Yes. As I said in my initial report, the potassium was very high, but because of the hemolysis, I cannot make a determination right. whether it was significantly high in terms of administration of potassium. On the lab report that you have in front of you, uh, it shows that the liver enzymes are, are very high, correct? That what? The liver enzymes, AST and ALT. Most mortem liver enzyme. Okay, let me, are, let me ask are, a better question. Don't have, I, I wouldn't make any kind of conclusion or, or reference because cells break up, liver cell in particular, and those enzymes are released. So. I cannot say anything about the significance of post-mortem uh, liver enzyme. Right. I mean, post-mortem blood evaluation generally is fraught with problems, isn't it? Well, it depends on the elements. There are some elements which, which disintegrate, like potassium. The other element is, is protein, which do not. Okay. Dr. Perper, typically it's fair to say that there are no autopsy signs uh, that are conclusive of drowning. Isn't that a fair statement? There are no autopsy, in other words, be, besides the dilution factor which I discussed. No, even including the dilution factor? No, I disagree. In a case like that, in which the death is, was quite, uh, occurred shortly, uh, in other words, the person was found shortly after she died, in which I have those uh, point of references before and after in regard to substances which stay in the blood and they were diluted more than 20 percent, I think yes. If you ask if there are additional signs of drowning which can be used for the determination of drowning, the answer is yes, they were not used in this particular case. So today you're, you're saying that, um, that it's the dilution that uh uh, is, does what tip the scale for you to, to make a conclusion of drowning? No, I don't say that. I said that both the findings at the time of the resuscitation of the body plus the dilution factors which I discussed before of element which don't break up such as the red blood cell, such as the, the um, protein, the albumin, the, the platelets, those do not break up. Those elements indicate that there was significant dilution, which is not explained by anything else than by drowning after considering the infusion of therapeutic fluids. There are other tests to determine drowning. As I said, they were not done in this particular case. Okay. And in addition to dying, which um, causes hemolysis and drowning, which causes hemolysis, there are also uh, illnesses that can cause hemolysis as well, correct? Yeah, what? Illnesses, viruses? Yes. And, and you don't know whether Michelle was sick or not with, with some sort of an illness which also could have caused hemolysis, do you? And, and, and this would be absolutely sheer speculation right. because the clinical records do not indicate any evidence of hemolysis. The medical records do not indicate, every, uh, the, the autopsy finding do not indicate any evidence of bleeding. They do not indicate any evidence of recent, bleed, recent or old bleeding. They don't indicate changes in the spleen which are seen when there is chronic hemolysis. So there is absolutely not evidence of hemolysis in vivo in this person. To a significant degree. I'm sorry? If, if the hemolysis was in a smaller degree that didn't lead to bleeding, then you wouldn't know whether there was evidence of that or not, right? I, I cannot speculate on something which is not present. That's my point. And you testified at the preliminary hearing as well as in your report that while 
there could be some variability. It is your belief that Michelle passed away within an hour of when she arrived at the hospital, if, correct? If you remember in my, in my preliminary hearing, I, I exactly. said that most likely is an hour, but I cannot exclude the possibility that there are two hours, two and a half hours. I understand, but you said that it's your belief that it was within an hour, correct? It's usually, it's an, usually in, within an hour, considering all the elements which I mentioned that they have to be right. considered when there is a drop in the temperature after death. Can I approach, Your Honor? You may. I'm showing you what's been marked as exhibits BB and CC. Yes. These are prior medical records. Yes. For Michelle McNeil, and I've, I've highlighted temperatures. The first is from, from when she had cervical spine surgery in 2003. I believe you testified about some lab results. In relation to that, yeah. And would you uh, just the temperature in 2003, which you outlined in yellow, is 336.2. And just would you just identify the temperatures and go through page by page? So we have. Okay, this is on January 23.03. Is is uh, in yellow the temperature noted 36.2. In, uh, on 22nd, it's in handwriting, the 22nd of 2003, it's 36.2. In, uh, I have a problem because it says print time. I would assume that this, I assume that the date here is January 22nd, 2001, because it's at the bottom on the right. Okay. If this would be January 22nd, 2001, then the temperature is basically in the, uh, is 36, 36. So the variability between those three is between 36 and 36.2. Okay. And then on, again, appears to be January 22nd, 2001, at a different time, at 13 hours, it's 36.3. Then on the same day, at 0, 04 hours, is 36. Then on still January 22nd at 11.40, it's 35.5. And that temperature is even less than her temperature was when she was um, checked at American Fork Hospital, correct? Yes. Okay, let's keep going. And then at Again, on January 22nd, 2001, is 36.2 at 20 hours, which is at 8 o'clock in the evening. Okay. And then if you turn to the next exhibit, I forgot the... CC, I CC. think. These are records from Michelle's plastic surgery. And April of 07. You see the highlighted temperatures that were measured in those records? This is, uh, it says, 404-2007. Yes. And the temperature at that time is 98.2. And I have a problem in... That's the moment if I can do that. 98.2 would be much higher than 96.8 because 96.8 was 36 degrees Celsius. 98.2, I cannot tell you. I have to look to see exactly what's the, the uh, temperature 
98.2 is in Fahrenheit. Yes, and, 30, and, and it's, 36.8. It's how much? 36.8. Does that sound right? If you made a calculation, a calculator, I, I. Yes. So the te the temperature varies, varies, and oh, you want to go? which one is that? This one. Yeah. Go ahead. Do you need to see this? And then on um, this is on again on four four. Not clear the time. It's another temperature which is ninety eight. And before it was 98.2. And then on, um, four, again, 4-4, four, four, 2007, is 96.6. 96.6 would convert four, Dr. Perkwork? I'm sorry? 96.6 would be equal to 35.9. Yes. Correct. And then, and then, on uh, 403 is 96.4, which is 35.8. Yes. Okay. And now on again 403.07 at. Uh, Time at 19 hours mm -hmm. is 96.8. Is 36. And then it's 96 at uh, again 40307 at uh, 9 9:30 and a half a half an hour so later. So it's 9:30. It's 96.0, correct? Right. And that's half 30. an hour later. 35.55 or 35.6, right? And, and so Dr. Then, Perper, before you move on, and so, so that yeah. temperature is actually even less, again, right. than what Michelle's body temperature but was what I, the American correct. emergency room. But temperature of an individual varies during the day, varies during the night, mm -hmm. and varies according to the condition. So, right. so, so, keep, so, so keep what I'm saying, next. in order to fully evaluate, I would have to see the temperature when she is totally normal during a normal visit, and then in the hospital, different condition of her can affect her temperature. Okay. So the next temperature? Then the next temperature on 403.07 is at, uh, at 20.30, which is 8.30 p.m., is 96.2. Or 35.7. Yes. Which is what the temperature was at the American Fork Emergency Room on April. Right. Correct? Right. Then, we move to admit um, exhibits BB and CC. No objection. BB, CC are received. Dr. Perper, isn't it fair to say that as far as the baseline goes, that uh, Michelle's temperature uh, tends to be lower than 36.6? Yes. And so her temperature drop most likely when she arrived at the emergency room was, was actually probably not very much at all well, from her baseline, except, correct? Well, except that at the time when she was examined in the hospital, where post-mortem lividity clearly observed on the back and on the arms, and this under no circumstances happens in half an hour or an hour. So. Uh, so it's a discrepancy between those. But remember what I said in regard to the temperature, that it depends on the variety of environmental condition. So if she was in the water, if she was in the water and the water was warmer, mm -hmm. then it would warm her body be above her normal temperature. So what I'm saying is you have to take in consideration both the drop in the temperature 
and both the post-mortem lividity. Post-mortem lividity doesn't appear to this extent in, in half an hour. To, to what, you don't know what extent it appeared to, do you? I'm sorry? You don't know what extent post-mortem lividity appeared, do you? You weren't there? Is the range of post-mortem lividity. I know That's that post-mortem lividity... Pepper. You don't know the, what the range of post-mortem lividity was, correct? I know that, yes, well, I, I know that the post-mortem lividity was present at the time when she arrived at the hospital. Dr. Therefore, ben Magnus testified in this case that he doesn't know when he observed post-mortem lividity, whether it was when she arrived or when it was later. He doesn't recall. All he recalls is that he noted it. That's correct. What and I'm so saying is that at you're, the time you're again of making assumptions, correct? Objection, argumentative. We're ruled. I would uh, like to ask I'm sorry. Question. Ask the question again. You're again making assumptions uh, about the evidence based upon what you think it is. No, I don't make any assumption at this time. What I'm saying is the following. There's no assumption. Okay. There's a statement in the hospital that there was post-mortem lividity on the back and on the arms. Now, my knowledge of post-mortem lividity okay. is... Prosecution can ask you about your knowledge if you want. The, the statement in the record is that postmortem lividity was, was observed at some point uh, based upon Dr. Van Wagener's notes that he wrote up after the, the incident with Michelle was done. And he doesn't know when he first observed it. What, what he knows or doesn't know, I don't know. I'm, I... And nobody else uh, observed postmortem lividity in this case, correct? Paramedics didn't? And nobody else denied its presence. Um, paramedics denied its presence. I, I don't think there's a, there's a denial. Uh, I'm sorry, what's your objection? Assumes facts not in the record. Uh, didn't a I paramedic? I asked them and they said yep. they didn't see it. Overruled. It's not a denial. Not seeing it versus denying that it's Overruled. Not. Overruled. Or do you recall um, writing an article titled Time of Death and Changes After Death? Yes. And do you recall stating in, in your own article that postmortem lividity may be evident as early as 25 minutes after death? Yes. Isn't that inconsistent with what you just testified to here today? As I, I said that it cannot be within half an hour, it, can be, it cannot be within 20. In my experience, most of the time, is not only 25 minutes. In the, in the article, yes, I said it could be, it could be under 25 minutes. So yeah. post-mortem lividity may be evident as early as 25 minutes after death. Yes, it can be evident, but I don't say where and how extensive. And you don't know where and how extensive, well, I guess you know where, but you don't know how extensive it is in this case, correct? I know because it says on the back and on the arm, so it's pretty okay. extensive. Dr. Perper, um, in, the, in your report, you also took some issue with the autopsy in relation to the injury uh, or the incision on the right part of Michelle's head. Is that correct? I, I said that the incision and the injury to the head, I could not distinguish between them and any other kind of inflicted injury and I said that they are consistent with bleeding coming from the surgery. May I approach, Your Honor? You may. I'm showing you what's been admitted as States Exhibit 10. And that's the incision at uh, the, the right part of, of Michelle's head, correct? Well, I am not sure that this is an incision. 
This is an area on the because I have to judge them on the photograph. Okay. Well, the plastic surgeon has already on, on, testified in this case that that was that was a surgical incision. Oh, and it's a surgical incision because from the photograph, what you see, it's an area of a scab, which is which is dark, it and it's it's uh, surrounded by uh, some bleeding. So if he said he made an incision there, that's an incision there. And at uh, in your report. Uh, you said that um, that you cannot determine uh, whether uh, that uh, was a result of a blow or secondary to a, a fall uh, into the bathtub, correct? Yes. So fair to say that uh, that if someone fell into the bathtub and, and hit their head on that incision, it, it could cause bleeding, correct? No, there, there are two things. Two things happen. If this is an incision, which is a surgical incision, that's the end of it. It's a surgical incision done by a doctor, doesn't have any, do, any way to do with the trauma. At the time when I wrote that, I did not know that, so I said it can be not necessarily an incision made by a knife, because you cannot say this from this particular photograph. It looks that it might be a laceration, a splitting of the skin. It could be from a fall, or it could be from something during the surgery, and I was unable to say which is which. Dr. Perper, at the, the preliminary hearing, again, on another page, you indicated that the drugs in Michelle's system, in your opinion, uh, were not a significant contributory cause of death, and you doubt they could have had, they could have caused some kind of impairment, either in motility or in, you know, it was inaudible. I, I said, I remember saying in some place that in my opinion they are not a cause of death, but they might play some role. Right. Uh, you also said, uh, and, that, and we've, we've talked about that on another page in the preliminary hearing today, uh, on page 1494, you said that you doubt they, the drugs, could have caused some kind of impairment, either in motility or in inaudible. Uh, that's what you said at because the preliminary hearing. Because they were in the, in the therapeutic, uh, yes, that's what I said in my opinion. And, and at the time that you made that statement, uh, we all believed that uh, the, the Fenergan level was approximately 0.1, correct? Yeah, the what? The uh, Phenergan or promethazine, sorry? Yes. Mm -hmm. We believed at that time that the promethazine was approximately 0.1. Right. Now we know that uh, it was just detected in some unknown amount. Right. Correct? So based upon what we know now, the, the medications uh, from the toxicology report, at least, uh, at least in relation to promethazine, may have been less. Yeah, but I remember what I said both during the preliminary hearing, and I said now that I do not know what are the true concentration of the drugs because I was, I believe, even asked about that. And I said because of the dilution, I don't know what were the actual concentration, and because I don't know the initial level, I cannot right. say how much it was the dilution. And I understand that. It's a fair statement. And, and so Michelle's blood... It, it was diluted to some degree. Right? They were diluted. Percentage. Well, there was diluted. Well, I know that it was diluted to a significant degree because if you remember during my direct examination, what I said about Sorry, about the 20 the 20 percent which should have been diluted and the, the excess dilution which was 50 percent or higher. Yeah, yeah go ahead. And so, if, if for blood. was diluted, let's say 50%. Yes. If the blood was diluted 50%, it would be unlikely that we would actually get lab results that, that came back from the, from the machine, wouldn't it? So from the Some blood results, in other words, the dilution of the different elements was not the same. For example, okay. for hemoglobin was 33%. For the, for the protein was 50%. 
for the thrombocytes was about 80 percent. Okay, so they, 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 there was what I can say is there was significant dilution beyond the amount which was therapeutically given to her. But you can't just take the differences and, and make a percentage on dilution because hemolysis also affects the, just hemolysis from dying affects the, the blood as well. The hemolysis affects the blood, but it doesn't affect the protein because the protein don't get broken down. Protein is something that is necessary in wound healing, such as after you've had plastic surgery, correct? Protein is a, is, is a substance which is necessary to be in your blood, and basically it reflects the state of your nutrition. Right. And, and so if somebody hasn't been eating much after plastic surgery, for example, protein levels could go down. Right? No, but if, if there would have been a, a decrease in, in protein from, from 4 gram percent and to 2 gram percent in 8 days, there would be significant clinical manifestation of, of those. There might be edema, there might be a lot of things. Lack, Defini of wound, lack of wound healing, for example. No, no, the wound, wound have nothing to do with the wound healing, wound, wound drop the protein in the blood, no. Uh, if, if you don't have um, proper protein, is it fair to say that wounds don't, don't heal? If you, you, you need to, to be severely malnourished in order for the, for the, to have an impairment of the, of the repair of wound, which she so was If you look at page two on the exhibit, uh, in relation to the AST and the ALT, again, they, they tested the, the liver enzymes once, I, I, and then they diluted the blood to reconfirm it. I right. told you the AST and the ALT, I, I cannot make any judgment, dilution. That's not my question, Dr. Popper. My question is, is that they were able to then dilute the blood again to retest the ALT and the AST, correct? Yes, so what? Uh, okay. So they, they were able to dilute it again. So if the blood, well, let's go with your numbers, is 50% diluted. Yes. Now you have to factor in post-mortem redistribution, correct? No. Okay. But in, in relation to, that was a bad question. So in relation to the medications that were found uh, in Michelle's blood, oxycodone, uh, zolpidem, diazepam, and promethazine, okay? Uh, if, if you were to try and make any conclusions uh, based upon the post-mortem heart sample uh, and consider whether they could be higher or not, something that, that you indicate you don't know because you don't have a baseline. But if you were to try, you'd also have to think about post-mortem redistribution as well, correct? No, it's not correct what you say. You, your questions are so complicated that I have to address them by explanation. I okay, cannot say, I cannot say yes questions. or no. Okay. You testified at the preliminary hearing that uh, you understand the principle of post-mortem redistribution. Yes. Correct? And you testified at the preliminary hearing that post-mortem redistribution could occur within the 25-hour period of time of, of at least when she was pronounced dead at the hospital at 103 and 215 when the autopsy occurred, correct? Correct. And, and you're aware uh, that there are um, various, well, what are referred to as central to peripheral ratios uh, that uh, are used in discussing post-mortem redistribution, correct? But in order for me to answer this thing, I, can, I have to... Okay, let I'm, me just give one I'm trying to ask you a simple question at a time, Dr. Perper, because I, I understand I ask bad questions sometimes, and I apologize for that. And if you just answer my simple question, then hopefully I'll, I'll get to the point. Okay. okay. So you understand that, that there are central to peripheral ratios uh, that uh, uh, are have been measured in relation to all four of the medications that were found on the toxicology report conducted by the Utah Medical Examiner. Yes. Correct? And at the preliminary hearing, you testified that you're not a toxicologist and you don't know those ratios, correct? That's correct. And, but you were here in court yesterday and heard Dr. Gray testify, correct? Yes. And he testified about some of the ratios, correct? Yes. And so oxycodone, for example, he said could have a ratio as high 
as six. Yes. Correct? And so if we use a high end, and many, I'm a defense attorney, I use high ends, this uh, would, the high end ratio of six would have a much greater effect in evaluating the possibilities of the toxicology report values than a, a point five factor for dilution. Yes, right? except ex that's true except when you forget about the drowning and about the dilution Be because because no, sorry, I was to well and asking you this particular question okay, I asked the questions uh, I didn't I didn't intend to forget about drowning I understood that that, that we were using a, a high number again of potential 50 percent dilution potentially from drowning potentially from resuscitated fluids right and so if we were to to attempt an unreliable process, generally, of looking at uh, post-mortem heart blood toxicological results, the potential factors for post-mortem redistribution are way higher than the potential factors for dilution. No, I disagree. Why? Well, I disagree because you have two processes which work at odd here. One is the process of, di of dilution, which decreases the amount of real concentration of the component in the blood. Mm -hmm. You have then the redistribution, which only applies basically to the relation between the heart and the blood which is taken from the heart. So in redistribution, it means that the original concentration of the blood inside the heart is lower, in fact. And as a result of the distribution, some of it is leaked from the muscle of the heart in the blood of the heart. So therefore, you get an increase in the concentration of oxycodone in this particular case. But this effect is counter is a, by the process of dilution, which dilutes the thing. Now, your statement that the dilution is less than the, the death distribution doesn't have any grounds of proof or evidence. If the blood was diluted, it would have been diluted contemporaneous with drowning, correct? Correct. Because if her heart wasn't pumping, there's no way that blood possibly could have entered from her lungs into the bloodstream, correct? The, the dilution occurred when her blood was pumping. Correct. That's correct. The dilution. Just, just tell me. Yes, but no, the, the, your question is not a clear question. I'm sorry. Okay. If if the heart isn't pumping, water could not enter the bloodstream and dilute the blood. If the if blood. if Correct? the blood yes is not no? yes, if the blood is not pumping, you, you then. You my question. I'm going to ask you another. One. And so, postmortem redistribution is a phenomenon that, that would then occur after any sort of dilution has already taken place. Yes. Okay. And post-mortem redistribution uh, occurs because of drugs which are stored in the tissue, heart tissue. In the heart lung tissue. tissue. Not in the lung tissue, in the heart tissue. Well, well post-mortem redistribution occurs from, from the heart tissue as well, right? The, the measurement is done from the blood. You don't take blood from the lungs. Well, of course not. But post-mortem redistribution uh, also uh, occurs because of drugs that are stored in the lung tissue that also leach out. It and can be, yes, to it the can heart, happen. Right? Yes. And so you've got all the tissue that's around the heart that factors into the postmortem redistribution analysis, right? You can have postmortem redistribution if the blood is taken from the heart then the postmortem redistribution is effective from the heart and not from the lung. I, if I, you I take understand that we're not taking blood from the lungs. My, my only point, doctor, is that, that the, the drugs that are inside the tissue would not be contemporaneously diluted by any amount of water uh, that entered the bloodstream while a person was alive. Correct? No, that's not true. When the, when I'm not talking about the blood. I'm talking about any drugs that are in the tissue. 
when you take drugs, there is a distribution of the drugs, and this is called the volume of distribution. Right. There is a distribution, in other words, when you inject or you eat a certain drug. This drug is absorbed in the blood. Right. In some drugs, they remain in the blood. Mm -hmm. They are called to have a small volume of distribution. Right. They are drugs which go out from the blood inside the tissue, such as the oxygen. Those are the drugs which have a large volume of distribution. The, large, the, the drugs which have a large volume of distribution, like the oxycodone, enter the tissue, like in the heart, and post-mortem, they can leak inside exactly. back in the blood of the heart. Exactly. How about Dr. Purper, referring back to the, the lab result, the lab test that, that uh, was exhibit. This one. Yes? There's also a, a value there for lymphocytes. For what? Lymphocytes. I'm sorry, I don't understand. The, there's a, a value on the labs for, for the lymphocytes in Michelle's blood. Yes. And we talked about that at the preliminary hearing as well, correct? And on the report, it shows that her lymphocytes increased from 2.6 to 6.2. Yes. Correct? And that uh, increase in the, the lymphocytes, uh, you indicated, uh, can occur from viral infections of, of some nature. Correct? Some of them, they can also uh, um, increase in number of lymphocytes have been reported in near drowning, so they can be associated with drowning. And as a matter of fact, the literature says that the increase in the lymphocyte during drowning, or, and especially in near, in near drowning, is a bad uh, prognostic, if, uh, prognostic um, factor for kidney disease. You didn't say that at the preliminary hearing, did you? No, I didn't. Yeah, in fact, you, you just said that uh, uh, there would be viral infections of a different, different nature. Right? Uh, yes, viral infection can do that, except that there was no viral infection. Well, you in... don't know that, do you? Yes, I know that. Okay. Because there's no evidence in pathology of any viral infection or clinical evidence of viral infection. At the preliminary hearing, you also said that, in your opinion, she died primarily of drowning with natural death, with, with some natural death contributing but no, no way, no possibility of determining this really within a reasonable degree of medical certainty. That's what you said, right? That's right. That, 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 that she died of drowning, as I said before today, that there might have been an arrhythmia, but I cannot determine whether it was or not, and that's what this sentence says. Right. And, and that's consistent with um, what you put in, in your report as well, correct? And this is what? Uh, that's consistent. What you testified yes, to at the preliminary hearing is Absolutely. consistent with your yes. report. And, and in your report, uh, you, you said that it's your professional opinion that a, quote, terminal cardiac arrhythmia secondary to hypertensive cardiovascular disease could have been a contributory factor in the cause of death. Yes, that's what, that's what I said. It's a possibility, as I said. Okay. May I have just one moment, Your Honor? You may. You may redirect. Excuse me. I believe I offered all of the exhibits and the receipts. So.
Go ahead. Dr. Perper, um, we've talked about possibilities here and the possibility of an arrhythmia. What is the difference of, of between what could have happened and what happened? Well, what, ha what happened is a fact. What the person believes that it happened is a belief. If, if the fact is proven, that's the truth, that's reality. If, if a person has a belief that it might be reality, if it corresponds to reality, or it may not. And as a scientist, you, degree, you, you operate under a degree of, a reasonable degree of medical certainty, correct? That's correct. You were asked to refer to your preliminary hearing transcript testimony with respect to comments about sodium and the changes of level in sodium. If I can have you refer to the preliminary hearing transcript, doctor, to pages 1455. If I could just have you read to yourself pages 1455. Yeah, I'm going to, I'm just wrong. Yes, I'm on page 1455. If you could just take a minute and read pages 1455 through 1458. If you could just read those to yourself, and then I'll have a question for you in just a moment. Okay, I, I read page 1455 and 1456. Would you read 1457 and 1458 also? The context of this testimony is talking about the effects of drowning and the absorption, absorption of water into the bloodstream, correct? Correct. And the diluting effect on chemicals within the, system, within the body, correct. in the blood. And is it true that in addition to sodium, you also talked about potassium? Correct. Is it true that you also talked about magnesium? Yes. Calcium? Yes. and also indicated that there are a lot of chemicals which are, which are vital to the maintenance of life that are diluted in a drowning case. Correct. That was addressed at the preliminary hearing. Yes. Thank you. We've talked a little bit about the, the body temperature following death. Would you just again explain what variables or what factors will affect the drop in temperature after death. Objection asked and answered. It's sustained. Isn't it also, is it also true that drug use prior to death can also affect body temperature? Yes. And you testify that body temperature varies throughout the time of day for an individual. That, I'm sorry? And you also testified that the body temperature of an individual varies throughout the day. 
Yes, that's what, what we call diurnal and also nocturnal changes, yes. Okay. You were asked a question about whether or not the paramedics observed lividity or law enforcement observed lividity on Michelle at the house in Pleasant Grove before getting to the hospital. Yes. What is your recollection of the testimony from the paramedics? It, Objection, Your Honor. He, foundation. Uh, su sustained. I, if you'd like to present him with, with, what you, they, with, with what they said, that would be fine, but I don't think he should be called on to remember the entire trial. Go ahead. Is it your understanding that the testimony from the paramedics with respect to lividity observed on Michelle was that they did not look for it? It was not reported. Your Honor, I think that that's a misstatement of the facts that are in evidence. And I Th this is, goes to the issue of did they look for it? Was it a denial? I'll allow it. You may clarify. Go ahead. Are you aware of whether the paramedics denied seeing lividity on Michelle? at the house before going to the hospital? Objection foundation, because there's no evidence that he was here and heard their testimony. I assume he's been watching. Is that true? Uh, did, you, did you observe the testimony of the paramedics in, in this trial on TV? Yes. OK. Overruled. Go ahead. Was there testimony from the paramedics that they denied looking for lividity? I, I, I didn't listen to any denial, such denial. But there is evidence that lividity was observed on Michelle at the ER, at the emergency room, correct? That's correct. And where was that lividity observed? It was observed on the back and part of the extremities. And what does that mean? What's the significance of that, doctor? It means that there was significant lividity observed at that time, and, and therefore the person was dead for some time. And how does lividity present? Lividity presents as, as um, discoloration of the skin, which is somewhere between purplish and pinkish more toward the purplish, and it's present on the dependent area of the body. In other words, on the part of the body which was facing the ground, because it's due to migration of blood by gravitational forces to the lower parts of the body in the small blood vessel or capillaries of the skin. Is it your testimony that if someone performs effective CPR on an individual that's drowned, that that individual is going to vomit water? Vomiting means an active action by the person. In other words, in order to vomit, a person has to be alive. And that person doesn't vomit. However, if you compress the chest, like in this case, of a person, and you compress the chest and in the process also the, the, the stomach, because the stomach is partly in the upper part of the chest, you can get regurgitation of fluid of, of fluid in which the individual is ground, both from the stomach and from the mouth and the nostril. But this is not vomiting. Vomiting is a vital per action of a human body. Okay. Will that regurgitation necessarily happen immediately upon performing chest compressions, or no. might there be a delay? If, if you don't, no. If you don't, the, the person is not alive, so he cannot vomit. So his, his stomach and his upper airway, except for the, the blood, for the, the water which he already inhaled, is there like in a container, like in, in, in a rubber bottle. So in a rubber bottle, if you keep it and you don't press on it, there's no going to come up, or come up any water. If you compress it, obviously up, you are going to expel water, and that's what happened when you compress the chest of a person who has water in the stomach and in the airways. Okay. Uh, it's your testimony 
You testified earlier that it is your opinion, <coughs> excuse me, well beyond a medical degree of certainty that Michelle McNeil drowned. Is yes, that correct? that's my opinion. Well Within beyond. Within a reasonable degree of, of reasonable certainty and beyond, yes. And beyond. Thank you. Do you have recross? In your report, uh, you described um, the vomiting as possibly a terminal agonal event, correct? Yes. Okay. And uh, that would mean that, uh, uh, that there was some metabolic function still going on in order to to vomit, and no, that was the no, last. No, no metabolic function. The person has to be alive. Right. Is, is, it doesn't have necess it is, in other words, he has to have reflexes, right. which are live, living reflexes, in order for him to vomit. And at the time when I wrote my report, and that's what I think it's even implied in my report, mm -hmm. I wasn't sure whether this was compression or whether there was, because they say gurgling, and it was, gurgling was, was not a clear test, so I did not know whether it's actual vomiting or it's compression. Right. And, and what, what you understood at the time led you to believe that it's possible that that could have been a terminal agonal event. Yes. Right. If, if she would have been alive, it would have been an, an agonal event. Yes. And, and you made that uh, opinion at a time that you knew that uh, they were doing CPR. Yes. Her, correct? Yes. And... One thing that, that has not changed, um, uh, both from the time of your report and preliminary hearing and here today, is that when you consider all of the circumstances of this case, you, you still conclude that uh, the manner of Michelle McNeil's death is undetermined. Yes, right? for the reason which I explained them in detail, yes. Right. Thank you. One last question, Your Honor. So, the, Doctor, the regurgitation of the water here was due to compression, in your opinion? That's, that's my opinion, yes. Thank you. Anything else? No. Do you have questions for this witness? Pass them to the end of the row, please. Counsel, will you approach the bench?
Just a couple of questions for you. Would the use of CNS depressant drugs raise or lower body temperature if you know? I'm sorry, wait, I'm sorry. Would a person using CNS depressants have his or her body temperature go up or go down if you know? If the, if the CNS, CNS depression? If, if a person ingests a CNS depressant drug, does it raise or lower body temperature if you know? I, I don't think it's a mathematical answer. It depends on the drug. Some drugs can cause death and others might not. So unless you know you're speaking about a specific drug, you cannot say that. I at least don't have the information. I would have to see what is the specific drug and then to check whether there's such a reported drop in temperature for the particular drug. If the person is in shock, it might be a decrease in temperature if the, there is an overdose of the drug. But if, if the drug is in therapeutic, in therapeutic doses, I would, my opinion would be that there would be no significant decrease in the blood temperature, in the body temperature. The second question, could the dilution of blood be explained by a natural filling of the airway with water, not from inhalation, and, and then subsequent resuscitation efforts? There's a no, the, the, uh, the question is unclear because there is no natural, natural flooding of water in the airway. What happened in the airway, you can have, as most people know, they can have mucus. If there is mucus in the airway, particularly is if, is if, if it's thick mucus, it can interfere with the breathing or it may prompt coughing. But there is no natural, there is no natural installation of water in the airways and there's no therapy. There might be, if, if people have a bronchoscopy, which is an examination of the airway uh, through, a, through an instrument, they may lubricate it, but, but they are not going to, to, to instill any significant amount of water because pulling water in the airway is basically equivalent to drowning if it's a significant amount. Do you have any follow-up questions, no, Mr. Honor. Spencer? Go ahead. Dr. Prepper, the oxycodone uh, or Percocet with Tylenol would have the effect of lowering body temperature, correct? It may, and again, as I said, it may, it depends on the amounts. If it, the amounts have to be significant, if there are low amounts of low therapeutic amount, is not going to be significant drop in temperature. I one question, Your Honor. Yeah. We don't know what Michelle McNeil's temperature was at the time of her death, correct? That's correct. Very good. You may step down. Thank you. You're free to go. Uh, release your honor from is he released from his trial subpoena? We'd like to keep him under subpoena just okay. in case, but he is an expert, so he... Very good. Thank you, Honor. You'll remain under subpoena. You may step down today. Thank you. Thank you, Honor. Can I leave the stand? Uh, yes, please. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll now be in recess for the weekend. Uh, remember my admonition to you. You have a sworn duty not to discuss the case among yourselves or with anyone else, including family members and friends, uh, and that's any subject of the trial. You are to avoid uh, internet, television, radio, news coverage of the trial. Don't do any research on your own using your personal computers or something else. And you have a duty not to form or express any opinion about how the case should be decided until you've heard all the evidence and it's submitted to you for deliberation. Tuesday is election day um, in the general election years. Uh, like 2014, there's actually a statute that requires courts to, to close only for 
only be open for very limited purposes on election day. That's not true of the municipal election uh, in 2013, but I do want to make accommodation for you so that you're able to vote in your various cities in which you reside. There are several ways we could do that. We could start a little later in the morning so that you can, I think polls open usually at about 7 o'clock and allow you to uh, vote earlier in the morning. You could vote after 3 o'clock if you chose to do that. Um, I'm just posing this to you and it lets you decide how you'd like to do that. Would you like to, to start a little later? Let me get a sense for that. I'm seeing a lot of heads for later. Okay, let's, uh, let's begin at 10 o'clock on Tuesday then. It should give you ample time to get to the polls in uh, your various cities, vote, and then come to court. Uh, remember to wear your uh, lanyards so that you're identified as a juror. We'll commence at 10 o'clock. Court's in recess. All right. Thank you. Please be seated. So for Tuesday, uh, witnesses will be looking at who? We're looking at Spencer Cannon, inmates four, two, and one, and uh, possibly Jeff Robinson. He's an investigator. Okay. I believe we could probably get there. Then on Wednesday, we've talked about maybe calling a witness out of order. That's, I would say, Your Honor, excuse me, with probably in between, I get the names, in between inmates four and two. Probably looking at Jason Poirier. Okay. Wednesday, we may call a witness out of order. We've talked about that. Um, and then it, additionally on Wednesday, who would we be hearing from from the state? That may wrap up our case. Those witnesses there, Your Honor, we can okay. see how far we get Tuesday. Very good. All right, uh, earlier today we talked about some objections uh, under Rule 404 with respect to the testimony of inmates one through four. Would you like to explain what your objections are? Um, yes, now I was specifically, um, I hadn't completely prepared for the other inmates today, but I was specifically referring to Inmate number three, and in his um, testimony, uh, he he would indicate that, as I understand uh, the, the report, that he had a conversation with Mr. McNeil, and that uh, he asked uh, Mr. McNeil if, if he had um, killed his wife, and, he's, and Mr. McNeil said no, uh, that uh, he ain't killed his wife, and then uh, later there was use of the word bitch, and, and it wasn't in relation to the question of did you kill your wife, uh, and, and so I think that, the, that that should be excluded under both 404 as well as 403. Um, the other issue that, that um, we need to address as I was working on preparing last night is how do I ask questions of these witnesses about other inmates? And about their associations with each other? Yeah. Which ones would have um, a relationship with each other? All the federal inmates. Um, One through four? Yeah, we had some. 
interaction with each other? At some time or another, they may, they may all have had some interaction with each other. What I would suggest is that the state prepare um, exhibits that show the picture with a label inmate one, inmate two, and that way you can present the picture and say, do you know this person, yes or no, and then we'll refer to this person as inmate two. And that, that's how I'd like you to do that. Any other 404B concerns? In relation to inmate four, there was a similar um, use of, of the same word. Okay. The, the inmate four also uh, does not say that Mr. McNeil uh, made any sort of admission. Uh, the, of inmate force testimony as I read it. Obviously, I can't speak for the prosecution's intent, but since my mind thinks differently than theirs, I'm sure. But, but it's primarily, a, a, my speculation is that they're primarily bringing him to discuss a, a conversation that uh, he allegedly had with Mr. McNeil about um, introducing medications through an enema. And so I don't think that the use of that word is okay. material to the case. And, Thank you. From the state? Um, it'll probably come as no surprise to the court that we don't believe that referring to Michelle as a bitch is 404B evidence. We think it's intrinsic um, because this is the person the defendant claimed to have been sorrowful over why did you get the surgery? Why, God, did you allow this to happen? Certainly this would be impeachment of those statements and relevant to his state of mind at the time of her death. And these statements are made some years afterwards, is that correct? True. Can you give me the time frame off the top of your head? Um, yeah, probably between 2011 and 2012. So, you see, it seems to me you're hard pressed to show intrinsic well, when you're when you're looking at five years past mm -hmm. the event. True, but um, I don't see any reason why his state of mind would have changed. I, Nothing's been presented, but uh, again, it it impeaches his prior statement that that he might have cared. Okay. Um, as far as 403 evidence, is, uh, 403 objection is raised. Um, in terms of overmastering hostility. I mean, we have someone who is accused of killing his wife. Using, using a word like bitch is not going to overmaster hostility in light of all of the things that are presented, including infidelity and the other things. The, the reason I press you on the intrinsic is, issue is, is just that, that, you know, the fact that a person may express contempt for another some five years after the the event, there are, whatever they may be, ample time in which intervening things could give rise to that feeling. And so I'm, I'm just pressing you on the intrinsic issue. Well, if, I, if I've miss, if I'm not thinking about that clearly, I'm happy to be I, I educated. First, what could happen is not what's at issue here. There's a lot that could have happened, but there's no evidence that anything would have changed. Additionally, Michelle McNeil was not in a position to do anything to make him angry ever after her death because she was already dead. Regardless, even if, even if the court were to construe it as 404B, it's relevant. Uh, it's important to show his uh, feelings about her We'd ask the court to allow it. Oh, well, there's one other factor, Your Honor, that I forgot. It also corroborates the other inmates who say that he referred to her in that way, including the ones that um, we allege that he confessed to her killing to. So it, it creates a uh, coherence of, of narrative for the state? Correct. Okay. Anything else from the defense? Mr. McNeil's state of mind five years later is not relevant uh, to the elements of the offense for which he's, he's charged. Okay. There is the one other inmate that Mr. Corey referenced that um, uh, makes a comment.
comment. Uh, again, it isn't um, in relation to. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's essentially I'm glad the bitch is dead. This is the comment, but I, I don't think that that um, corroboration adds any significance to to the statement. And it's, either way, I think that it's. Thank you. From the state, just so that my thinking is clear, what are the non proper non-character purposes that you would want me to be looking at? I think the most specific would be intent, Your Honor. Intent to kill? Yeah. And we've talked about state of mind and corroboration. Uh, anything else? The corrupt, I, I think the statement that the counsel's alluded to from Mr. Poirier speaks more to that, but I think this, again, corroborates that. Okay. Okay. That, that's very helpful. Thank you. My, my hope, uh, counsel, would be to give this some thought over the weekend and do some reading and research, and I'll, I'll rule on that uh, in the morning before we get started. Maybe if you could be here 15 minutes early. Your Honor, I have one other matter I wanted to raise. Yes, go ahead. Prior to trial, there were a number of pieces of evidence excluded for various reasons, and the rulings did not necessarily or specifically address opening the door, but I believe there are two pieces of evidence that the defendant has either offered or elicited that opened the door to some of this excluded evidence. First was a question posed to Sabrina about what else her father stated to her when he first came into the bedroom with a towel over his head. And Sabrina recognized this cue and stated that he said, families are forever. The clear inference of which is that he cared for his family. Contrarily, the court excluded evidence that the defendant kicked his older daughters out of the house and um, talked about giving the younger daughters to the Bledsoe's before giving them to Alexis. This evidence should now be allowed and is relevant to demonstrate the defendant was not the family man. He professed to be to Sabrina which statement and inference were brought out by the defense. Second, the defendant presented a letter of recommendation. So I'm just making some notes. The, the kicking out of uh, Alexis in the days following the funeral and the older daughters. Uh, it's the older, all the older daughters. Yes, Vanessa, okay. Rachel, and Alexis. And then the Bledsoe ish, you know, issue. I think it was July. I'm going to give the kids, or I'm contemplating giving the younger children to the Bledsoe's. And then Alexis taking them. Okay. Uh, number two, the defendant uh, presented a letter of recommendation to Alexis asserting that she asked her father to provide a forgery to her medical school to impeach her. Now, while she denied this, the allegation remains, and this opens the door to the defendant's other forgeries or frauds, the identity theft, the insurance fraud, and the fraudulent filings to demonstrate that it is the defendant who has committed and created forgeries without Alexis to vindicate Alexis of the allegation that was asserted. It is relevant to counter defendants clearly contemplated and consciously executed impeachment of Alexis. Thank you. From the defense? Your Honor, in both instances, well, addressing Sabrina first, her statements were, were gratuitous, not something that that uh, the defense intended to, to elicit in, in any way on either account. Okay. And so uh, to assert that we, we opened the door in relation to that, I, I think that there's absolutely no basis. In relation to the, the letter of recommendation, uh, that uh, was also, uh, we didn't know what Alexis's answer was going to be, but that wasn't a question that, uh, I, that should open the door either. Uh, because there was a certification together with that uh, uh, that application that indicated that everything that was submitted uh, was was true and correct, and it was based upon that certification together with the application that uh, that we asked the question that she she certified that that letter had been 
been submitted and was true and correct. She answered in a way that we didn't predict. And which was? Which was she said that her father sent that on his own. Or that she'd never seen or it. Or that she'd never seen she it. She was unaware of the letter. Or something like that. Uh, I had no idea that that's what she was going to say. And obviously couldn't to impeach her any further on that. And, and so that was, that was an end of that. I don't believe that, that there was any intent on Peter's part to, to get into material that, that the court has specifically excluded. And I don't believe that it, it poses any prejudice to the, to the state either. Neither of of these instances resulted in, in any significant evidence being elicited. Thank you. And, Your Honor, I'd just like to comment because at the bench conference when um, this issue came up with Sabrina, um, I was asking her about that Alexis had brought up the nanny statement and she volunteered, oh yeah, when I was at the blood sows, there was something about the nanny. So there's absolutely no way I, I could have predicted that she would have brought the blood sows out through a nanny statement. When I was directing her about dad crying in the towel, um, I was having her read that she was crying. I had her read the statement and said, and you said she was crying. And then she said, oh yeah, and families are forever. And I was not eliciting that. She volunteered that. And so she brought that out. Uh, we did not elicit that. Thank you. I don't want you to feel double teamed. So, oh, no, I'm fine. Yeah. Okay. And I think Ms. Gustin is right as far as the blood cell comment is concerned. I don't think they were listening to that. In fact, I don't think they want that out. So I don't think that was the case. But when I looked at Sabrina's interview, the only other thing she said at the time her dad came in was the comment about families are forever. I don't know what else could have been being asked for with did he say anything else. And, and these are things that trial counsel has to contemplate. As far as the forgery is concerned. Do you have, do you have a transcript? We do. We, we at least have the report. Do you have the report, uh, Jeff, of Sab Sabrina's interview? That was how he disclosed to her that her mother was dead. Oh, I thought you were referring to some kind of trial tr transcript that you have or something. Oh, no. I no, was, sorry. okay. All right. I was referring to if you were preparing to examine Sabrina, the only other thing in her statement or her interview would have been the families are forever, at least to the best of my recollection. I think that's the case, though. As far as the forgery is concerned, um, as, as the court probably knows, with law school or any other graduate school, letters of recommendation are sent separately, and the person has to seal the envelope and sign over it or whatever. So that was a, a risk, a contemplated risk that the defense took when they asked about it. And let's let's say Alexis did know about it. It still doesn't change the fact that um, assigning culpability for that um, forgery was still pointed at her. I think the question was a very direct leading question and you had him do this for your medical school application, something to that effect. I think the question was, did you just you submitted a false letter of recommendation? Is the question that? I think you said, didn't you say, and you had your father submit or something like that? No, I, I think that she then responded and said that he submitted it separately. I, it was my understanding that, that that was all part of the package. Based upon that, I asked the question, believing that she had submitted that all together. So there was no thought process, as you mentioned, that, that I thought that would have been submitted okay. separately. Okay, I, I still think there's an assumption of risk there, Your Honor. And, and as far as the families are together comment, that's not helpful to the defense in this case. There is so much evidence that the state has elicited that. Um, circumstances in this case where, where even the state's witnesses have said things that uh, are inappropriate. And things like that happen during trial. But, but we have tried extraordinarily hard to, to limit our, our examination to not open any doors, and I believe that, that we haven't crossed that line in this case. You know, there was an example even last night that I noticed as my wife was watching clips from Nancy Grace. Um, Vicki Willis was, was interviewed by Nancy Grace. And if you may recall, when she testified at trial, she said that um, 
and or she was asked a question about when Michelle had passed away, and we objected and, uh, and said that that was hearsay because it was our belief that that was a statement made by Gypsy Willis and not Martin McNeil. And, and Your Honor overruled our objection, and, and she testified that it was her understanding from Mr. McNeil that, that Michelle died in January. Well, on Nancy Grace, she testified unambiguously that she heard that from her, from her daughter Gypsy, not Mr. McNeil. My point is simply that witnesses are unpredictable, and, and we have not we worked really hard to not open any doors, and I don't believe that, that these these examples that the state has brought are are examples of, of anything that we have done that we should open any doors that would negate rulings that Your Honor has made in this case. Thank you. This is your motion. Anything else? I've made my record, Your Honor. Okay. The state moves to introduce evidence that this court has previously excluded on the ground that the defense has opened the door. And that changed circumstances now uh, warrant admission. First, the state contends that by eliciting the statement from Sabrina that the defendant made on the day of Michelle McNeil's death 
that families are forever, or what's important is that families are forever, uh, opens the door for the admission of evidence that within days of the funeral, the defendant kicked out Vanessa, Rachel, and Alexis from the family home, and that uh, sometime in the summer of 2007 proposed that the younger children be given to or cared for by the blood sows. Your Honor, can I interrupt? I apologize. Yes. I, I believe that kicking out was June 8th. Thank you. Yeah, it was. Thank you. Yeah, in the June of 2008. I mean, sorry, or 2007. 2007. Yeah, it wasn't within days. There, there was some... I, I'm thinking of the testimony that uh, Alexis had was kicked out with, within days because of the controversy over the nanny, but that didn't apply to the other older children. This is this is the June event that we're talking about. Okay. Right. Uh, so that the the state argues that in light of the families are forever statement coming in, then it ought to be able to introduce evidence that the defendant kicked the older daughters out of the family home in June of 2008 and in the summer or 2007, and in the summer of 2007. Uh, propose that the younger children be cared for by the blood sows, uh, a family out of state. The state uh, also argues that by impeaching Alexis's character for truthfulness by use of a specific instance of conduct, namely the providing of a untruthful letter of recommendation in her medical school application that the defense opened the door to acts of fraud committed by the defendant uh, on his own. The defense argues that uh, it did not intentionally elicit information from any witness designed uh, to, to open the door but has consistently s sought to keep those doors closed and that with respect to Sabrina the statement of the defendant was volunteered and that the defense could not have predicted the response of Alexis to the question regarding the letter of recommendation, which was that her father sent that in on his own and that she never sought. Having uh, considered those arguments, uh, I'm not persuaded that the families are forever statement uh, opens the door to these two other bad acts and for the reasons originally stated in the pretrial motions, they remain inadmissible. With respect to the um, forgery, or the, uh, the fraudulent letter of recommendation, I think the context in which that comes in is important. Uh, Rule 608 provides that, it, that except for a criminal conviction under Rule 609, extrinsic evidence is not admissible to prove specific instances of a witness's conduct in order to attack or support the witness's character for truthfulness. But the court may, on cross-examination, allow them to be inquired into if they are probative of the character for truthfulness or untruthfulness of the witness. And that's, that's essentially what's happened here. By taking the witness stand, Alexis has placed her character for truthfulness at issue. The court has allowed her to be examined on a specific instance of conduct 
probative of her truthfulness or untruthfulness, and the rules provide that no extrinsic evidence would come in, and the defense has, in fact, lived with her answers to those questions. I'm not persuaded that by engaging in that process of impeaching Alexis's character for truthfulness, that the defense has opened the door to essentially what is conduct directed toward an untestifying defendant's character for truthfulness. I don't see that that makes sense. I also think that uh, for, Rule 403 would continue to exclude these uh, other acts of the defendant in any event and uh, will deny the state's renewed motion to admit the defendant's fraudulent conduct. I will take under advisement the um, 404B issues that we've, you've raised this afternoon regarding the inmates. Um, and if you could prepare those photographs so that we're preserving identity, I think that will be helpful. Is there anything else this afternoon? Nothing from the state, Your Honor. Thank you. Very good. Thank you again for your work. Courts in recess.